Greetings, everyone. This will be a special nonviolence report for a very special period of time that we are passing through in this country and the world. And uh, I think I'd like to pick out a few items that are happening around the world that illustrate some of the tensions and some of the issues that we have to be dealing with. And of course, come down to the recent events in the United States with this unprecedented attack on our Capitol building and our democracy. And those attacks are not over. The tensions that led to them are far from over. So I want to spend a few minutes with you talking about that uh, before we close the nonviolence report for this week. So uh, just kind of jumping around because there are some awfully interesting things happening in the world, but the most interesting being right here in the U.S., but I'm going to start with something that took place in Ecuador. Recently, there was a strike of medical students. And uh, a couple of notes that they pointed out. This is a quote from one of their spokespeople who said, there wasn't really a strategy. It was more of necessity. So this points to a dilemma that is very, very common today. People do not react to injustices until they are uh, getting kind of flagrant in their face. And then when they react, all they can do is protest. So what we're trying to do in the nonviolence community constantly is reach people to encourage them to respond sooner, i.e. by constructive program, and to have a lot more things in their repertoire than a protest. So, by the way, the strike was successful in the end. One of the reasons it succeeded was that police used excessive force against the medical students, which is kind of shocking. And most of the country was unaware of their demands until that happened. So you had kind of a paradox of repression, where the more they repressed, the less power they actually had in the situation. But it didn't need to be that way. You know, it was not what we sometimes call a dilemma action where you put your opponent in a corner and they either give you what you want or they don't. And in the either case, they in the latter case, they get a lot of pushback. So I'm moving around, as I said, and I'd like to put the spotlight on something that recently happened in Israel because 60 high school students have now agreed to refuse to serve in the military because of the occupation of Palestine. And they sent in a refusing letter. And I hope that we appreciate the courage of this act because in Israel to refuse military service ends up in jail time. But they said, and I'm quoting, it is our duty to oppose this destructive reality by uniting our struggles and refusing to serve these violent systems chief among them, the military. So that's from the letter. And it goes on to say, and this is a point I want to emphasize also, it goes on to say, our refusal to enlist in the military is not an act of turning our backs on Israeli society. On the contrary, our refusal is an act of taking responsibility over our actions and their repercussions. This is such a rich event for me because, of course, I, I was a conscientious objector at one time, and I heard this argument all the time, you're not giving back to society. And it was through that episode, that time of my life, that I came to realize that the very best part of me that society needs is not my mindless obedience, but my moral witness, my taking of responsibility. And you may remember that in the famous episodes that took place during the occupation of France in Le Chambon, where oh, thousands of Jewish refugees were sheltered and saved, the people in that little village who did it, they often at the end of the war, people would say, oh, you were heroes. And they would say, no, not at all. We were les responsables, the people who took responsibility. So better or worse, mistaken or correct, if you take responsibility for your actions, you are making a positive contribution to the whole. 
Well, this is a time when unarmed civilian peacekeeping has become very significant, uh, especially domestically. But I want to point to one thing that happened uh, in a cross-border intervention. This is Peace Brigades International, and they are in Colombia. They have been in Colombia for 25 years. And unfortunately, after the signing of the, quote, peace accords, the violence against human rights workers has escalated. So 47 volunteers from PBI, which relatively speaking, is a big team for unarmed civilian peacekeeping. Of course, it's negligible for military. So 47 volunteers were on the ground in three critical parts of the country before COVID struck, and now they are quarantined and regrouping. So it really does show you what a uh, trifecta of, of challenges we're facing these days. So one more news item, if I may, and then we'll go on to look at some of the very, very rich resources that are coming available. And that is, again, here in the U.S., and it's about the rent crisis. There are tens of thousands of people facing eviction in the U.S., and many of them have come together in a rent strike, as well as all these other uh, events, interrupting evictions, these other tactics, occupying vacant but habitable homes, outdoor encampments, advocacy for legislative relief, including universal guarantee of homes for all, and of course, mutual aid. So according to the Turner Center for Housing Innovation, which is at my alma mater, University of Berkeley, 16.5 million families who rent housing have lost their income as a result of the pandemic. So uh, among other things, this shows us that when people come together against a common difficulty, they can often create a kind of community that will stick together after the difficulty is resolved. And we certainly hope that this will happen. So we will be able to bring you more uh, about this event. It will take place very soon, Sunday, and we, we will be reporting on the very interesting uh, situation in Finland, which is important because the Nordic countries are often stigmatized as, quote, socialist. And as a matter of fact, they are capitalist economies, basically, and uh, doing well by doing good. You know, if you help everybody out, it seems everybody benefits. I want to mention that the Gandhi Research Foundation in North Central India is putting on a winter course on peace and nonviolence. And that'll be starting this month on the 22nd, and it'll run through March, and it'll be twice weekly, and our film and a talk by myself will be there. This coming weekend, uh, out here at Stanford, and of course online, is Martin Luther King's birthday, and Clay Carson of the Martin Luther King Jr. Peace and Justice Center at Stanford, though he has technically retired now, has pulled together resources from around the country to create a really rich event that is going to go through the four days of the weekend and included as a film festival with some 11 documentaries, mostly focusing on Dr. King. Uh, our documentary, The Third Harmony, will be included along with a 10-minute discussion of the film and its relevance between myself and Dr. Carson. So look to uh, Stanford events, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Center, uh, to get the details and, f and find out how to join this very, very rich resource, which will be a wonderful tribute to Dr. King. So let's turn now to some discussion of the crisis in American democracy, uh, you know, I've been around for quite a long time now, and this is by far the greatest, most severe crisis to our democratic system that I've ever experienced. And I imagine that'll be true for just about all of us. 
Today, the president was impeached for the second time. The last I saw, uh, Mitch McConnell will refuse to convene the Senate to uh, carry out the trial. But nonetheless, that does carry certain repercussions. Every thoughtful person that I'm aware of is recognizing that it's critically important not to scapegoat that individual. Uh, He must be held to account, otherwise the precedent will be disastrous. But if we make a scapegoat of him in the sense that we think that by uh, impeaching him, possibly even giving him some legal punishment for the, the many crimes that he's committed, the tendency will be for us to you know, think that we have resolved the situation. But as a matter of fact, as we know, there are tens of millions of people and uh, they have grievances that must be heard. This is sometimes bitter for us to face. Why should we listen to them? Well, we should listen to them for two reasons. Because, you know, they are our fellow human beings. And because on the strategic level, if we don't listen to them, How will this conflict ever be resolved? Assuming that we can come out of the situation of the next few weeks and get President Biden inaugurated and set ourselves on a saner course, that is, get through the violence and turmoil which has been threatened for the inaugural event and around it, and threatened at many, many state capitals around the country, get through all of that, we still will need to think what was or what were the forces that propelled these people into this action. One of them was the severe degradation of truth and the commitment to truth, which has been, I think, and I constantly am mentioning this because I think it's true, it has been Uh, promulgated mainly by advertising. Advertising in itself seems relatively innocuous, and it seems to be pointed only at a particular item or a practice or service that's being offered. But the exaggerations get worse and worse, the twisting of the truth, the claiming that you have scientific studies backing you up, when all the listeners know perfectly well there are no such studies All of this has drawn us away from truth. And uh, as Gandhi showed, truth and nonviolence are opposite sides of a coin, or even he even said at one time, a smooth metallic disc, which doesn't even have head and tails. So the violence that we saw on January 6th was partly a result of the departure from a truth responsibility, a truth commitment, that has been brought about slowly but surely in our culture. And it has to be, that is one of the many things that have to be addressed. There is a tension that I'm feeling in the community between the desire for some kind of uh, retribution and the need, or the perpetual need for restorative practices. Well, even in restorative justice, They make allowances for what Gandhi famously called the madman with the sword. That is, you must, in the first instance, stop violence from happening, protect people who are being victimized by it. People and, in this case, a democratic system, which Gandhi said, not our system in particular, but democracy in general, when properly carried out, is the finest thing in the world. But as he quickly added on many occasions, you cannot have democracy in the real sense of the word without nonviolence. So that's our dilemma. We have set up a democratic system in terms of voting, but we haven't backed it up with a nonviolent culture. And without that, our democratic system is crumbling. So I'm hoping that people will come to that realization, look very deeply. I'm hoping that a lot of people who were casually committed to the kind of attitude and policy that the outgoing president represents will see now 
what it leads to. What has happened is uh, it has come to the surface. It, it, you know, the bubble has burst and we can see what it contained if we know how to look. One other element I'd like to mention here. As people who've been studying QAnon and the conspiracy theories have pointed out, one of the grievances that's driving these people into these delusional positions is a lack of meaning. Even the person who discovered or promoted the idea of a paradigm shift, Thomas Kuhn, he was working in the uh, history of science when he did that, he was quick to point out there's no such thing as not having a paradigm. You have to have some kind of framework that tells you how the universe works and what you're supposed to do in it. So the fact that these people have latched onto such a fantastical and really uh, dangerous nonsense shows that they were coming from a vacuum of meaning. And that's where I think we here in the progressive community, in the peace community, I think we can provide a framework of meaning, which, is, which I have been calling the new story, and that is what our Third Harmony Project really is all about. As uh, G.K. Chesterton, the Catholic writer who was once, someone once said to G.K., you know, it's, just, it's a shame if, if people don't believe in God, they, they won't have anything to believe in. And he said, no, my friend, it's much worse than that. If people don't believe in God, they'll believe in any. Well, whether you believe in a personal God or not, whether you're in a particular religious framework or not, we all need a framework of meaning, a plausible explanation for the world and our experiences. And that's what we have left a lot of people without. So that, uh, I think, will be our final security to be able to give people a new framework which is satisfactory, which enables them to find a meaningful role in their life and a constructive community, or as Martin Luther King said, a loving community to live in. That is the nonviolence report for this week.